The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. In fact, it is the entire ninth chapter, and usually the Johannine uh, lectionary texts are quite long, but I'm going to only read seven verses. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Teacher, who sinned that this man, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then the man went and washed and came back and was able to see. Now the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the living word of God will stand forever. Amen. Will you please be seated? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The man is born blind. He has never seen the budding leaf of trees in the spring. He has never seen the iridescent colors of a beautiful bird. Neither has he seen his parents' face nor has he seen his own reflection. And Jesus heals him. And he sees. And this event sets off a controversy. A controversy of theology. A controversy of cosmology. Never in the history of the world, it says later in the text, has anyone been cured having been born blind. In fact, they believed that it was not possible. Even the one who was born blind who could now see could not understand what had happened to him. Today, even today, we have difficulty fathoming this this narrative in John's Gospel. John tells this narrative to address a multitude of questions. The disciples ask the first question for us. Who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Who caused this event? Now, the first part of that question is almost an absurdity. And it shows how the disciples were so ingrained to sin, cause, and the effect of of illness. How in the world could the man have sinned he had yet to be born? So we must conclude it must have been his parents that sinned. Now Jesus upsets the theological apple cart. He is attacking this 
idea of sin produces disease and illness. Pretty much all in that day, in that area, believed that's what happened. Sickness, disability, disease was caused because someone didn't do God's will. And if you were one sick, you were considered to be a sinner. Only the righteous were inoculated from having diseases. Only the righteous could escape calamity in their lives. And Jesus tells them that the healing of this man will reflect the glory of God that is with us. That God's work in the world will be revealed through this particular man. Hopefully, all of us are no longer bound by this superstitious way of seeing that sin causes disease in other human beings. Illness is not God's punishment visited on the sinner. But the religious people around Jesus could not accept this theological turn of event. They believed, as you find out in the story, that Jesus was tricking them. The old switch that this new guy came, the old one went off, the new one came back. They even went to the man's parents and asked, is this really your son? Yes, it is. They just couldn't believe it because it was so ingrained, this theology. Another theological turning point in this text, and also the rest of the Gospel of John, is that the miracle narratives show that God is in the world reconciling people to God. The first miracle in the Gospel of John. You may remember, Jesus, and this is the favorite miracle for some of you, Jesus turned water into wine. Hallelujah. Now, the God in that day who provides the wine, the grapes to make the wine, was Dionysus. Or, in the Roman word, not the Greek, Bacchus. Now, Bacchus was in charge of the entire fermentation process from the growing of the vine to the stamping and smashing out of the juice to the fermentation to the bottling. It was all Bacchus, Bacchus' work. But never had Bacchus or Dionysus taken water and instantly turned it in not to just average wine, but the best wine that money could buy, eliminating the entire process of the grape grower and those who smashed out the juices and those who bottled the wine. It was to say that Jesus is greater than Bacchus or Dionysus. Another miracle. Jesus multiplies the bread in the feeding of 5,000 people. Now the goddess in charge of grain and bread was Demeter or Ceres, as the Romans called her. As a matter of fact, from Ceres, we get cereal. When we eat cereal, it's uh, 
uh, goes back to this particular goddess who provided for the grain. But the bread that Jesus provides is a finished product. There was no need for a farmer, there was no need for a harvest, or there was no need to go to the grist mill, there was no need for a baker. Jesus is greater than Demeter, or Ceres, the God of healing. The God of healing was Asclepius. Jesus, by healing one that had never been healed in the history of the world, a person born blind, John is expressing that Jesus is greater than that particular God. At Jesus, there is no division of labor. There's no special part of Jesus that can only do. He's not a one-trick pony. He can do it all. John is expressing he's greater than all the pagan gods. Now, cosmology, not cosmetology, which is six in your face. Cosmology comes from cosmos, world, the knowledge of the world, more concisely, a philosophy, a world view. How is it that we view this world? Is everything random? That's your cosmology. I know that for many, miracles are pretty difficult to swallow. If you really want to think about it, miracles are difficult to swallow. Many will accept that God created the world, but does not involve God's self in the world and in human affairs. Now, in my office, on my desk, when I can find it, it is not buried under paperwork, I have a snow globe. It says Christmas 2013 on it. It has a glass, you've seen them. And it has the Holy Family, Mary and Joseph, and the baby Jesus in it. And if you shake it, yes, it snows in the Middle East. And at the bottom, you can wind it up. And it plays silent night while snow is falling upon the Holy Family. And as much as you wish silent night would change, it is always the same song. And I cannot touch Mary or Joseph or the baby Jesus. All I can do is make it snow. Some people's world view or cosmological perspective is that we are under a dome and God is not involved and touching. God is kept out of our own little snow globe called earth. God may wind things up, but it's the same old song. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. This gospel lesson is breaking that mold in that particular pattern. Some would call it magic. Some see miracles as magic. If we were to say the right incantation, the powers around us would obey. There was a particular man in the New Testament. His name was Simon. 
And when he saw Peter heal someone by the power of the Holy Spirit, this Simon wanted to pay Peter for that same power. He was a magician. Later on, this became known as simony, the buying and selling of church offices or church power. Now, I particularly do not hold to magic. And I don't believe miracles are magic. That we are controlling the forces of nature. Instead, I would put to you this final section in terms of, a, of an argument. For the sake of argument, let us say there is no natural. There is no world that functions that is immune from the influence of God. What if all that we've been led to believe and call natural in the world is really, in truth, God's creation. God continuing to create. Creation is the result of God's loving and constantly, though oftentimes undetected, oftentimes hidden, interaction with the world. God is working in the world. What if God is not, not outside of the snow globe? What if more is going on in us and in the world than we've been led to believe in this modern world view that is so often espoused. What if the modern, modern worldview is actually the fictional worldview? Just another one idea in a long line of futile attempts to play God. What if what we call miracles is in fact God telling us and reserving the right to work in ways that disrupt our worldview and our settled opinions of what God can do and what God cannot do. What if the Scripture is correct? What if the Scripture holds the correct cosmological perspective? Genesis, the first chapter, the first verses. In the beginning, there was nothing but God. And God spoke a word, the Logos. And all came into being. In John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And there was not anything that was created that was not created by this Word. And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. What is that Word? It's a Word that we in our creation are not separated from that Word of God. It's all around us. That Word is life. And my wife and I rode out in the hill country, our bikes, the other day. And we ooed and awed. Well, she did. I don't ooh and awe. I'm kind of silent, but I'm listening and I'm looking. There were blue bonnets everywhere. There were all kinds of wildflower. It's... It's the hill country at its most magnificent peak. The air was fresh and dry. And all the trees had come, the green bud. And we pretended we were in Ireland. 
without the longhorns. Was God absent? Was not God there? I think we take the presence of God in all of life for granted. It dwells in the birth of spring. It is in the animation of the animals and even in us. And it is made clearest in the flesh in Jesus we call Messiah. That the purpose of life is to be reconciled to this living God all around us. We can call it miracle. But it is beyond our common understanding of magic. It is indeed the recognition that God pulses through life. And that it is Christ that can open our eyes that are blind otherwise. It's just another spring. It's just another stupid flower that will die when it gets 100 million degrees in Texas. Those are the responses of people that believe God is far far away, far gone, and we're stuck in a gl <clears throat> glass globe in a part of Texas that it never snows. But for those of us who ask and are willing to receive, we are given a new sight. And there is nowhere that God is not. One of my favorite paragraphs by Norman McLean in a book, A River Runs Through It, goes like this, and I conclude. It gives you something to think about. Eventually, all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over the rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops, and under the rocks are the words. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.